Good evening and welcome. Thank you for joining our sixth Enclave webinar on managing patients with lung cancer through the COVID-19 pandemic, What to Know. I'm your moderator this evening, Gina Columbus. I'm the editorial director for Enclave, and it is a pleasure being with all of you again tonight. It's crazy to think that we've all been meeting together for six consecutive weeks already. If this is your first time joining, some background might be helpful. The mission of this webinar is to provide our listeners with a free-form discussion on how you and your colleagues are managing your patients with lung cancer during the COVID-19 pandemic. Tonight, and as we have over the past several weeks, we will cover some specific areas of discussion that each faculty member will go into greater detail on and share their insights from the front lines. As you can see from the slide, this evening, we'll be getting to hear some experiences and perspectives from a very special guest on how some strategies have evolved with surgery during COVID-19, some of the pivotal data in lung cancer and with COVID-19 from the AACR virtual annual meeting, and then concluding with some future directions in lung cancer care as we hope to return at some point to some normalcy. So we do have a few housekeeping notes. If you are listening to this webinar, we encourage you to submit any questions that you do have, and we'll try to answer as many of them as we can during the QA portion of this webinar. We'll actually be trying to kick off the Q&A section a little bit earlier tonight than usual, and we'll try to fit in as many questions as possible. Also, to expand your video player to full screen, click on the icon on the lower right of the player, hit escape on your keyboard to revert back to the smaller player. So we have a very distinguished panel of experts on today's presentation, and I will ask each of them to introduce themselves and give their title and affiliation. Dr. Agarwal? Hi, everyone. I'm Charu Agarwal. I'm the Leslie Heisler Assistant Professor for Lung Cancer Excellence at the University of Pennsylvania's Abramson Cancer Center. Very nice to be here with everyone today. Thank you. Dr. West? Hi, I'm Jack West. I'm an associate uh, clinical professor in medical oncology, thoracic oncology focus at uh, the City of Hope Cancer Center in the Los Angeles area. I'm also the executive director of a program called Access Hope, focusing on remote consult services for people around the country. I'm very happy to be here uh, for this part of the series. Thanks. Thank you. Dr. Pinnell? I'm Nate Pinnell. I'm an associate professor of medicine and thoracic oncologist. And I run the uh, lung cancer medical oncology program at the Cleveland Clinic in uh, Ohio. Thank you. Dr. Liu? Hi, Stephen Liu. I'm an associate professor of medicine and the director of thoracic oncology at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. Thank you. And last but not least, Dr. Stiles. Hi, everybody. Thanks for letting me join. I'm Brendan Stiles. I'm an associate professor of cardiothoracic surgery at Weill Cornell Medicine and New York Presbyterian Hospital here in New York City. Thank you, everyone. And Dr. Stiles, we're very appreciative to have you here tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. So we have a great deal of material to cover in this discussion. So let's begin. Um, to start us off, I would just like to provide some very quick numbers on the current state of COVID-19. Currently to date, the number of global confirmed COVID-19 cases are more than 3 million with more than 207,000 deaths. The U.S. has now hit more than 1 million confirmed cases with more than 57,000 deaths. It has certainly been a very challenging and unique time for many of us, as a large percentage of us continue to maintain social distancing guidelines that have been put in place by our governing bodies, it is much more difficult for others to do so, specifically for our patients who have serious medical conditions that do require urgent attention. In our past five webinars, we've discussed how COVID-19 continues to impact so many aspects of healthcare, specifically in lung cancer, and especially how our experts are managing their patients' care while taking preventive measures. Tonight, we're going to be going headfirst into more pivotal discussion topics in this space. So with that, I would like to turn it toward our discussion with Dr. Stiles. I know that our panel has several questions for you, but first, would you be able to share some of your experiences that you've had in practice during COVID-19 and how has the role of surgery been impacted during this time? Sure. Well, it's, it's been an incredible time in New York City, as you've all heard, and I'm sure as you can imagine, um, our hospital system really has just been overrun with COVID patients. And we have a broad system that um, covers the campuses here in Manhattan at Cornell, but also Columbia, um, and then several other smaller hospitals in, in almost all the boroughs. It's been interesting to see how each of the hospitals um, individually have responded, but I think most importantly how the network has responded and how we've really stepped up 
um, and try to share resources across the network to deal with this. Our primary focus really has been treating COVID patients. And so with that comes the responsibility and the question of what do we do with our cancer patients and how do we take care of our thoracic oncology patients? It's been a question that's been um, weighing on our minds heavily and that we've constantly sought to address, but it's been a challenging one to do because of the sheer number of COVID patients. I was talking before we came on the line that I think the numbers today were something like 1,600 in the system, over 1,650. And that's the lowest number we've had, I think, since the end of March. So we definitely think we're on the downside, um, but that said, we still have over 550 intubated patients in the system. And at Cornell, it's, it's over 170 intubated patients, still with hundreds of patients. That's really affected how we've all been um, deployed throughout the hospital system, how, how our resources are utilized, and it's affected our ability to see our outpatients. And um, for me, it's affected my ability to get patients to the operating room and lung cancer patients in particular, both for staging and diagnosis, but also more importantly for treatment. Um, I'm sure the panel's gonna ask me lots of great questions, but, but as all of you know and think about, I'm sure it really affects stage one. Um, you know, lots of tough questions there about who can wait, who shouldn't wait. Um, how do we know that they're stage one? Are there alternatives to surgery? Um, stage two, maybe more likely to do neoadjuvant therapy. Stage three, maybe should we um, again do neoadjuvant therapy, maybe go non-surgical routes of therapy. Um, but I think it really has forced us to think a little bit more about multidisciplinary care than perhaps some surgeons do about what's right about the way and the risks and benefits of each of those. Um, and it's also sort of made us think about the stage four patients, how to, how to touch base with those, how to follow up, who can skip a treatment, certainly who can skip surveillance scans, things like that. Um, the practice of lung cancer, it's really been interesting. You've probably seen some of the news about sort of rising death rates in New York for unknown reasons. I don't know that those are lung cancer patients, but certainly we can see that we're probably getting a little bit behind with diagnosis. I think at our hospital system, and lots of other systems in the city, almost all of our pulmonologists are redeployed um, in ICUs, really doing a lot of the frontline intensive care work, and they're doing a tremendous job. But what that means for the outpatient um, sort of practice of diagnosing new lung cancers, new, new lung nodules, working them up, um, is, will be interesting, I think, and where we come out of here a few months down the road, whether we see big stage shifts or whether we miss some patients with early diagnosis. Lots of things going on. I think we've got lots of uh, sort of, hopefully we'll have answers from this. It's gonna take months to get it, but now really the focus is returning to how do we care for our cancer patients? How do we prioritize them? How do we make sure that they're getting the appropriate treatment? And I can, I'm happy to talk a little bit about how my own practice has shifted and how our outpatient inpatient practice has shifted, how we've used telemedicine to reach patients as I'm sure all of, all of the panel has already done. So Brendan, this is uh, a great uh, initial overview. You know, you mentioned um, a little bit about um, stage migration and that's something that's on top of everyone's minds about, you know, we are delaying uh, some of the scare that would have been otherwise done in a very expedited or timely fashion. Um, and, you know, we are all thinking that now we are, you know, three months or six months down the line going to be seeing higher stages of disease presenting because a lot of people have not had their yeah. scans or mammograms or colonoscopies, et cetera. Um, keeping this in mind, um, how did you manage uh, sort of your early stage one patients with tumors less than two centimeters, um, <laughs> realizing that you will have a shortage of resources or, you know, resources would be scarce? Did you follow the ACS guidelines pretty expeditiously or, or was it sort of a um, case by case decision? It's a great question. And I think the ACS guidelines are a great um, framework to go by. But as, as all of you know, you know, the individual cancer patient is hard to sort of um, put into just a bin and whether that's certain tumor characteristics that worry you, whether it's the patient's anxiety is just so much about not getting treated that it's hard to push that type of patient back. Most of the patients that, that had more solid tumors or higher pet-avid tumors were able to sort of get through and get in the system. I did um, start to refer some patients for stereotactic radiation and a couple for definitive stereotactic radiation. There were um, a couple, this idea came from David Palma up in Canada who did the Sabre Common and some other um, key radiation trials missile of maybe doing Sabre Bridge, this idea that you would treat a patient with radiation therapy, stereotactic, 
but not necessarily say I'm not going to operate, but but come back and sort of reevaluate in four to six months a little bit more closely than we typically would, and perhaps resect the patient at that time if, if you thought that they were operable and needed resection early on. For me, in general, any patients that have more than stage one disease, two or three, um, I've been sending down a path of neoadjuvant chemotherapy typically. I've, I've not tried to ask them to do chemo and radiation where they have to come in every day for the radiation therapy. Yeah, I, I'd be really interested <clears throat> in the, how to approach a patient with with stage two or three disease. And one, one question being, uh, are, how confident do you think we should be and can be about postponing, you know, kicking the can and, and thinking that it'll be better, it'll be easier three months down the line, uh, as well as, you know, do we feel comfortable with the immunosuppression of, of chemotherapy? I mean, I think that this is certainly an approach that I think uh, many people are pursuing of, of neoadjuvant and deferring on the surgery. And it's hard not to do that when, when all the ventilators in the institution are allocated elsewhere. But, uh, but I'm just interested in your thoughts of, you know, how confident you, you think uh, we should be and whether there have been any indication of problems with people who have started down the road of neoadjuvant chemo and maybe run aground or not. Yeah, I think it's a great point you make about the question of how many ventilators are there. And, and when we were in the, the phase where we were just going up, 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 and we really had no breaking room, then I knew that that was the answer that we had to do. As we've started to come out of it and plan, my thought has changed a little bit. It sounds like what yours is. I, historically, with neoadjuvant therapy, we only get a 5% benefit, obviously, with chemotherapy or the same with adjuvant. And arguably, if we can do surgery safely in a safe environment where the patient um, is protected from COVID infection, maybe just taking care of those patients up front, even sometimes skipping neoadjuvant for stage two or, or very early stage three might be the way to go in the system to keep them sort of out of trouble. Um, and that sort of, I think, is evolving and, and what we're thinking about now. We, like many others, have a neoadjuvant immunotherapy trial, and that we've obviously put on hold just because of some of the concerns with, with immunotherapy and the virus. I'm kind of, my, my thinking is sort of evolving, whereas neoadjuvant for most people that I saw now, if I saw somebody with stage two or very early stage three, and we have operating room capacity, I might even try to operate on them now and give therapy or send them to you guys for therapy on the back end. But I think it's a target that's going to move around a lot depending on bed availability, OR availability, um, and sort of patient factors also. You know, do they have to travel? Where are they coming from? How anxious are they about being in New York? Things like that. Brendan, you know, we heard so many stories about the hospitals in New York and how overwhelmed they were, and you're giving us just staggering numbers of how many ventilated patients there there have been there. Did there ever reach a point similar to what happened in Italy and other places where you worried or maybe even found that there weren't enough you know, resources for everybody that was there? I mean, did you ever have to think about policies, about picking and choosing who might be able to get a ventilator or you know, uh, discussions with cancer patients about you know, whether that was appropriate for them? I'm just curious um, your, your experience there. Yeah, great question. I, and I will say our hospital really did a great job flexing up and making more ICU beds. And we literally had ICUs everywhere in our operating rooms and the, in the PACUs and the, in the step down floors. I can't walk through the hospital without seeing an ICU. And we're fortunate that we're, that we're a system that could flex up and do that. And so we never got to the point where we had to ration care or tell some that they couldn't do this or that. Um, that said, we were obviously in touch closely with a lot of our cancer patients who were very worried and, and sort of expressed that fear almost of coming to the hospital and sort of being labeled as um, uh, a cancer patient, a lung cancer patient who may um, be destined for a poor outcome and maybe he or she should not proceed with aggressive care. Um, and, and I assume we'll talk about terrible later, but that was one of the sort of premises that in Italy that the mortality rate for lung cancer patients was perhaps high because they elected just not to escalate care in those patients. We've, we've done well. And I, you know, talking to our thoracic oncologist today at our tumor board, they've only had a handful of lung cancer patients who they know of, with COVID. Um, of, the, of the over 40 patients that we've operated on during this period, um, I know of two who got COVID afterwards. 
Um, but we've done well and been able to continue doing things safely and provide care to all of our cancer patients. That said, coming out of it, now we're going to have a backlog. We need to figure out how we can sort of escalate the process and, and get, get to do the things that we would always do before. As we start to ramp up clinical practice, you mentioned that you've done some surgeries already. If you had the right stage two patient, then maybe you would take them right to the operating room. Can you walk us through your, your own sort of personal take on, on testing for those patients? Are you testing patients before they come to the operating room, before any procedures, uh, or only basing it on symptoms? Yeah, it's been a very, very much a moving target, and obviously dependent a lot on availability of tests. Currently, we're testing um, every surgical patient every morning. Um, you know, I, I can't speak for the hospital, speak for myself. I, I think it makes sense to test when they're sort of in the preoperative area, try to ask them to sort of isolate for, for some time before and then test again that morning. It's just such a moving target with so many potential exposures in New York City that it's hard to know who's negative for sure. And we have seen a couple of patients test positive on, on the morning of surgery. And obviously you get sort of one like that that exposes a lot of staff members or, or folks to it. And it becomes just a logistical um, issue, sort of sorting out all those contacts. But we're doing a good job. We're really ramping up testing for patients and for staff in the current period. And, and I think that's really for us going to be critical as we come out of this and really get back up to scale. And, and did you move forward with the surgery in that positive patient or did you delay that? Um, they weren't my patients. There was one that they moved forward with because it wasn't a cancer case. It was more for other issues. And then um, the cancer ones that are more you know, not urgent cancers, for those we would um, push back, obviously, because of some concern with complications secondary to COVID. Um, Brendan, how have you, how have you and uh, your multidisciplinary team handled um, staging the media steinum. Um, we at Penn have, uh, you know, stepped away from doing a lot of interventional bronchoscopies when we can avoid them. You know, when we see clinically something that looks like unresectable stage three, you know, pre-COVID, we would go in and document uh, mediastinal stations and sort of stage them. Um, how have you handled it? I think it sounds the same way. We had that same conversation today at our tumor board. And you know, as you can imagine, all the tumor boards are virtual now, um, which works out well. It lets other people get there and, and get around. But we're accepting clinical stage a little bit more than we had historically, where we would typically try and do um, rigorous nodal evaluation at least. Um, and, you know, sometimes the, the isolated pet positive metastasis that we would typically want to biopsy to prove stage four disease um, you know, in certain cases, we're, we're more accepting of that and, and allowing to, to not be so rigorous about having to biopsy everything. And I, we, we've had very similar problems with um, access to bronchoscopy and endobronchial procedures. I think um, a lot of concern on the part of the staff and the anesthesiologists that these aerosolizing procedures are really putting people at risk. So those, those are challenging. And I think when we can avoid them, it's probably best and safest for everybody to do so. And can you talk about, I know you've been very pleased and proud of how well people have stepped up the, the, the hospital, the whole system, but it's also, I know, been a, a real personal strain on, on everyone. I'm sure on you and, and, and everyone in the system who have been redeployed and basically are, you know, now taking care of extremely ill patients, potentially put in harm's way worrying about how to balance their, their uh, professional <laughs> dedication and obligation to versus their other commitments personally. And we see some, some things on social media or other settings of tearful staff members, understandably. And I, I just wanted to know if you could talk a bit about, about that personal side and how well people's spirits are holding up to the extent that you can, I know it varies, but it must be very trying times for a lot of the people there. Yeah, it's, it's really actually hard to put into words. It's been one of the most remarkable things for me to see. And, and you just sort of have to imagine walking through ICU after ICU. And I, I go through almost all of them every day um, and just seeing different faces, you know, OR nurses redeployed, floor nurses redeployed, nurses from other places. We've been very fortunate to have lots of people come and volunteer and people who you don't know or don't know how to use the computer system. Um, working hard, you know, for these patients and working in, in environments that, that there's not a lot of 
thanks going on from the from the patient or family side. Obviously, the, re- the rewarding aspects of medicine that we all got into it to do. Um, but you know, I, I tell people almost every day that I've been amazed by the morale of the teams, um, at least that I've seen working, and that they just keep going after it. And they, they form groups, and the hospital has been great about you know getting them having sort of people come through with with coffee, people come through with snacks, things like that. Um, and I, you know, I've just been so impressed, but I, at the same time, I am certain that it's taken an incredible toll on people. And you probably all heard about how New York Presbyterian lost an emergency department doctor to suicide just this week. Um, and so that obviously hit the community pretty hard and I think made everybody step back and appreciate that even though people may be holding up okay on the surface, that it, it really does take an incredible toll on people and, and day after day after day um, is challenging as, as, as you can imagine. And we don't get the sort of little wins that we get as, as cancer doctors, or you don't quite get that, that connection of feeling like you're really moving the needle. Um, it, it's a much slower process if you can believe that than with cancer patients, with, with these patients, although you know, we continue to fight pretty hard and, and at our place they're doing remarkably well, we think. And I, I really do believe that the, the key to that has really been the teams and been the flexibility of moving patients. Um, it's an amazing system from one ICU to another ICU to another ICU and just figuring out which ICU is best equipped, who's like the super ICU, who's maybe the step-down ICU, which which physicians are there, who needs to take care of it. But it's a, just a constant motion of patients to meet their needs, um, which requires amazing teamwork. And that, that I think, is going to be something that stays with um, my hospital system after this. We're just working with doctors from every single facet of the hospital that we never worked with before. Um, and those sort of borders are completely down now. Um, and, you know, the ability to sort of sort of cross-train, cross-collaborate, talk about these things has really been um, pretty inspirational. And I think that's something that will stick with the system after all this is done. No, it's absolutely incredible. Um, and we're all sort of in awe of hearing hearing how you guys are doing there. Um, so I, I have to ask this question, and I'm going to apologize ahead of time, but uh, you mentioned that you're starting to direct some of your patients towards SBRT. And so I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about what your what your current algorithm is on, or maybe, you know, even a couple of weeks ago, what your algorithm was, <laughs> wait, who you would... Um, yeah. you know, consider setting for SBRT, and more importantly, how deeply pained are you having to send someone you think you might have been able to get through an operation to SBRT? And, and do the radiation oncologists gloat when you do that? <laughs> um, I'm not going to tell how many I do and what they say ultimately, but um, look, I, I think stereotactic radiation is a, is a great treatment. And I think that in a lot of patients, it's it's a curative treatment. I I am somewhat concerned, as been discussed on social media, about the the long term survival and about the idea of the complete path response and missile and other trials. Um, but I am very concerned that my patients might not get good local therapy while they're waiting for this. And so I had no problems. Almost as soon as this started, I reached out. I had seen. Um, this, this great protocol from Sabre, called Sabre Bridge um, from David Palma with the idea that sort of, um, you know, he called it a pragmatic trial where while you're waiting for surgery and resources for surgery, could you do stereotactic radiation and then reevaluate sort of four or five months down the road to give them a little bit more time from that 10 week period of the missile trial and maybe see if complete path response rate is, is better than, than the 60% that was reported there. Um, with the idea being that behind the radiobiology should dictate ongoing complete path response. That's the part I'm not as sure about, uh, as you know, but I think um, I have no problem sending patients for that now, but I want to keep a close eye on them and just watch their tumor closely. And it may mean doing some PET scans or things we wouldn't ordinarily have done early, it may mean doing some rebiopsies and, and not taking away the possibility of surgery. But we, um, you know, we work super close with our radiation oncologist and, and again it, it's a great team that we have and so and one I even sent and he said look this one's not appropriate for um, stereotactic it's a little too close to the bronchus I think I'd have to give her conventional therapy and that's probably not the right thing right now either so now she's back sort of waiting for surgery and so I think we're just taking like like all of you do I'm sure a very collaborative approach and trying to figure out the best treatment for the individual patient. Uh, Brendan, very diplomatic my- answer. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, Brendan, you wear a lot of different hats. You know, we, we 
been talking about your perspective as a surgeon, as a clinical researcher, um, but you're also heavily involved in basic research, do a lot of work with LCRF. Can you, you sort of summarize yeah. the impact COVID has had on, on that aspect of lung cancer? Yeah, I think that actually that's one of the undersold things of this. And so I'm glad you asked the question. I, I think lung cancer research is really going to take a hit from this. And all of you know, we're already taking a hit on some of our clinical trials and translational trials and ability to do banking and do correlative studies. Um, but the labs, have, you know, Cornell and I'm sure lots of other places have, have shut down. And so science has sort of come to a halt. All that I think can, we can make up with that and catch back up with that at some point. My biggest worry though, is that a lot of funding is gonna be necessarily diverted for COVID um, and for the recovery of this and that we're gonna see lung cancer funding really go down. Um, and that I think could dramatically affect lung cancer patients at this time, as, as all of you know, the, the pace is so quick now of, of new developments and new research and, the translational and correlative studies of the new trials are just so critical to understanding what's working and why that if we're not able to fund those and do those, I think it'll be a real disservice to our patients. So we're working hard at the Lung Cancer Research Foundation to, to support investigators and particularly young investigators who we think are going to take a, a big hit on this, um, but also to sort of encourage industry to, to step up and try to support um, basic and translational research during this time. So, Brendan, how has your uh, personal practice uh, sort of evolved during this crisis? You know, in uh, medical oncology, we have quickly adapted to telemedicine. Um, I can't even imagine how busy you must be uh, in between, you know, providing critical care and surgeries. And how's your outpatient uh, practice looked like during this during this time? Well, Tim, I told somebody I've become a strictly a, a tracheostomy surgeon. I think. I think I've done or, or assisted on over 70 tracheostomies this past month um, as we're trying to move patients off ventilators and around. And, and uh, it's not nearly as fun as lung cancer surgery, but I think it's a really important part of these, uh, these folks. And that has really taken most of my time. Um, my, my practice has been interesting. As I mentioned, it's almost all shifted to um, telemedicine. About 75% of my visits now are telemedicine. Um, but like a post-op patient, obviously, I'll need to see her. I had a new cancer patient this week. Um, those are harder discussions, as I'm sure all of you know, um, over, a, over a Zoom meeting to, to tell a patient about their new diagnosis of lung cancer. How, you know, getting, you know, this past month, I really have done only a handful of lung cancer resections. Um, I hope to, to start to escalate back up and it'll probably again start with staging. But again, as I mentioned before, I, I'm a little worried just about the lack of nodules we're seeing just because all of our pulmonologists are um, in the intensive care units and because I assume patients aren't coming in for imaging. I was asking our radiologists today just about you know, incidental nodules that, that they're seeing in these scans or seeing um, incidental signs of, of COVID infection in some of our surveillance scans. And they said it's it's not been so common in what they've seen so far, but but I think it's going to make evaluation of new lung nodules coming out of this a real challenge. And I think surgeons are going to need to show some restraints um, in, in high density areas. We've already alluded to some of the potential risks of, you know, giving chemotherapy to patients and, and, uh, and uh, the risk of immunosuppression, as well as the risk of uh, immunotherapy potentially uh, with uh, it, with coronavirus exposure, you mentioned that. We also struggle with scant hints of data suggesting that uh, radiation or higher doses of radiation may be associated with greater complications and surgery too. There have been certainly early data sets or small and complete data sets that suggest that many of the patients who undergo surgery for lung cancer have had uh, poor outcomes relative to, to COVID-19. And I, I just want to get a sense of how much or how little concern do you have that, that this should be a, a factor or a deterrent or a concern? And do you have patients who are, are, are your patients all eager to have surgery as soon as they can? Or are some of them really fearful of coming into the hospital and being in a hospital setting for a day or potentially longer? Uh, during this time? Yeah, we're really concerned and it's something we're really watching closely and, and we're trying to push back cases that we really think aren't necessary, as I mentioned. 
Um, but we're keeping close track of our data during this time and who we've operated on. And, and you know, I think the last tabulation at the middle of, of this month, we've done over 40 cases between March and April. And again, as I mentioned, fortunately, less than I think 5% of those have been subsequently diagnosed with COVID. Um, I have seen some some patients from other cancer centers who, who we've subsequently taken care of for COVID-related complications. And without a doubt, if, if you do a big lung operation um, to a patient who gets a bad COVID infection, it's a, it's a recipe for disaster. Um, you know, as you alluded to, some of those early studies of elective surgery and cancer patients or elective surgery in general from Wuhan suggests as high as a 20% mortality. Um, and that included a handful of lung cancer patients. We've been fortunate that we that we have not seen that, but obviously it's something that we're thinking about every day and trying to avoid higher risk patients when we can um, and trying to really streamline post-operative care. Um, the how we sort of do that and how we come out of it and 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 where we go with it, I think, is really the, the next phase of this and, and how we address it. To the second part of your question, um, it's interesting, and I'm sure all of you know, patients can be totally opposite. Some will say, you know, I've got a cancer. I want to get the, that thing out of here tomorrow. And I'll say, yeah, it's a part solid. Don't worry about it. And and they'll still want it out tomorrow, and, and you just can't convince them otherwise. It's just a, a fear. Some, on the other hand, are so scared of being in the hospital and, and being around patients with the virus that they're willing to wait um, weeks to months, and then some have that balance. So you really have to, you know, and again, I know all of you, you know this and do this, just put on a different hat and really tailor your recommendations and, and how you describe it to the individual patient based on his or her needs and, and as you begin to understand their anxieties a little bit, try to account for that, which is really why things like um, the guidelines from the American College of Surgeons, I think, really should just be a framework. Um, but a lot of decisions really have to be made at the individual level between the patient and uh, his or her uh, physician. And as you start to hopefully see the light coming at the end of the tunnel, if the numbers are plateauing, and as they start to come back towards normal, what out of this are you going to be taking forward? What do you think is going to stick around over the next couple of years? Obviously, COVID is not going to go completely away, even if we get it completely under control, um, you know, at least for a while until we have an effective vaccine. Um, what elements of practice um, that, that has changed do you think, um, you know, both the good and the bad is going to, are we going to be seeing a year from now or two years from now? Well, that's a great question. I'll have to think hard about that. I, you know, the telemedicine thing, I go back and forth on, like I'm sure all of you do, whether I think we're going to see more of it and I haven't decided yet whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. I, I sort of miss that personal interaction with patients, but I think a lot of things I do and a lot of patients I see probably don't have to be that surveillance of recent patients is a great example. If they come and get a scan, um, you know, why do they need to see me for five minutes if they're just there to get a scan? I could see them on telemedicine just as easy. Um, that will stick around and it certainly has some uses. I think the ability to do sort of conferences like this and to sort of keep connecting with everybody should grow and stick around. And I think people get more and more comfortable with that as well, which in theory should really increase multidisciplinary care. And, you know, in particular, we're, we're pretty good at it at um, at our hospital, but I'd love to see other hospitals in the system join in and sort of talk with us. And I, I think this whole idea will facilitate that as well. I like to think that it will um, facilitate true multidisciplinary care, not just discussion, and uh, not just the sort of the surgeon dominating the room, like all the poor radiation oncologists we're talking about on Twitter this week, but but everybody's sort of coming together and trying to figure out what's the best treatment for the patient. And I, you know, it's, it's made us look at other options and you can't be, um, you know, so, so dogmatic that you think only one treatment is the right thing for each patient. I think we all live in a world where we know that there's recommendations, but we also know that there's some gray to that and we can find different treatments that are probably the best for different patients, depending on the circumstances. Um, you know, the, and the bigger picture, how the hospital comes out of this and how, how we learn to work together through systems, how we sort of, you know, respond to, to emergencies and disasters. I hope that we'll learn. I know that we will. I think all of us will. Um, that's probably going to have implications for other health issues or for other, um, uh, you know, human disasters or, or other disasters as well. Um, 
but I also think it, it'll help the hospital sort of prioritize, you know, coming out of this is really going to be interesting because I really think it's going to help the hospital is going to have to look and prioritize where they want to be, how they want to come back online, what's important to each system. And, and the answer may be different for different hospitals. Brendan, one of the things we've, we've seen come out largely anecdotally is that patients with COVID infections seem to be at a higher risk for venous thromboembolic events and clots. Uh, something you're pretty attuned to as a surgeon. Is this something you're seeing and have you changed your practice in any way? Well, definitely. I think every patient that I do have done a tracheostomy on is, is on some kind of uh, high dose blood thinner. And so that's, that's changed my tracheostomy practice, I guess. But uh, um, it probably hasn't changed our surgical practice that much again, because we're trying to avoid um, operating on the COVID patients, but you can see the evolution of the thinking throughout the hospital and the, the much lower trigger for starting patients on anticoagulation, I think as they get through this, I suspect that that will have some long lasting effects about how we think of, of other critical illnesses as well. All right, great, thank you so much. I'm gonna turn things over to the um, 2020 ACR virtual annual meeting that just took place over the last couple of days. So the attendance was something like 61,000 uh, members or attendees. So could you all maybe share some of the highlights and data that were presented relating to lung cancer and also to COVID-19? Yeah, so um, it was actually really exciting to uh, be able to participate on a virtual uh, level with so many attendees. I think ACR was the first big uh, national conference to do that and has certainly set the stage for other conferences to follow suit. Um, I think one of the interesting sessions was on cancer and COVID, which was held yesterday. And, you know, there were multiple presentations from China, Europe, you know, France, Spain, Italy. Um, you know, I, I think one of the interesting ones was, of course, um, the TerraVault study that, uh, as it relates most closely to um you know, thoracic cancer is something that's near and dear to all of our hearts. And uh, it was really uh, sobering uh, to see the high level of mortality uh, from the Italian experience of about 35%. And, you know, as we've been discussing um, symptoms, you know, not unexpectedly were very similar to how our lung cancer patients uh, present and often indistinguishable from COVID itself. Um, it was very, very humbling for me to see that mortality. And again, I think it, it just um, highlights the fact that our lung cancer patients are an extremely vulnerable population. But I'm interested to um, see what you know my friends and colleagues here think about the differential mortality rates that we saw um, you know, compared to the French data that didn't seem to have such high mortality. I, I don't have a great explanation. I think there's maybe real differences in in the demographics of uh, of these patients, but also, uh, you know, one question that we we may have is certainly something that I think many of our patients have, uh, and that is, are they going to be perceived as uh, you know, no longer meeting the bar for active aggressive treatment or not. I know that certainly some patients with particularly metastatic disease are really afraid that they would be deprioritized. And I, I just don't know, certainly when resources get extremely limited, whether that's going to be an issue of they're going to be the last people to get on a lifeboat. Uh, or get on a ventilator, actually. So I, I think that that might be a concern. Certainly, many of our institutions have had to develop policies that uh, that uh, put greatest priority on the patients who have a potential to be cured or a, a prognosis in the realm of years rather than less. Um, I, I just don't know whether that is a, a real contributing factor, but think that that might be a point of it. Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know exactly why uh, some countries are, are having a higher mortality than others, but the overall mortality was really sobering uh, in that group. You know, 35% of right. 
cancer patients who uh, are, are dying in the series. And obviously it's a very select group of very ill people who are being tested. So it's probably not at all, uh, I would guess, reflective of, of overall um, cancer patients who are infected, many of which may have mild disease or not even be hospitalized. But at least within this, that's a lot higher than uh, what you would normally expect. And so I think this really emphasizes all of the things that we've been talking about over the last six weeks about trying to keep patients away from exposures and, and risk of infection until we have an active treatment. The best uh, way to avoid that is to avoid getting infected. When I look at those terrible data, those, those mortality numbers are very striking, somewhat unexpected. But, but one of the positives that, that I really took from that presentation was just the, the collaborative nature uh, of the whole field. Um, you know, that was a report of 200 patients uh, across eight countries, 42 institutions. Uh, now we have over 160 institutions in this registry and, and the numbers continue to grow, just showing that you know, when we all work towards a common goal, we can go from an idea, a concept from Marina Garasino and Liara Horn on the 15th of March to uh, uh, potentially a publication presentation in the plenary session in, in less than a month. So uh, really showing that when we all put our minds towards a common goal, we can accomplish quite a lot. I think some of the, it, that's actually very true, Steve. And some of the other um, interesting data that came out from these presentations was this uh, discordant nature of um, associated risk factors, right? I mean, we saw in one presentation that chemotherapy and immunotherapy or TKIUs didn't have any um, sort of correlation to mortality. And then the French data showed that, you know, use of chemotherapy was uh, associated with higher mortality and worse outcomes. Um, but I suspect that that was driven by the higher number of heme malignancy patients. Uh, what are your thoughts? I agree. I think that's a good point. And certainly it's, you know, it's, it's interesting. I have so many patients. We all have patients who come in with a fixed idea of, of chemotherapy and say categorically, I don't want chemotherapy and we have to explain the nuance that chemotherapy is really a big spectrum uh, and uh, it, it's important to make this distinction. And I think we're struggling with that right now because that's a pretty big, broad bucket to put people in that, that may have a lot of variability within it. All right, thank you very much. So let's kind of focus on the future now. So as we look to eventually get back to a state of normalcy at some point, um, what do you think we all need to really kind of keep in mind as we continue caring for patients with lung cancer? What are some important future directions that we need to be taking? So I think um, uh, telemedicine is probably here to stay. Um, you know, I think um, as we prepare to re-enter, uh, I think we'll have to sort of split our clinic schedules into doing part telemedicine and part, you know, seeing patients actually in, in person. Um, I think social distancing will continue for a while, right? So I think even uh, trying to make sure that crowd, you know, our um, waiting rooms are not crowded and there's adequate social distancing in the waiting rooms will have to weigh into this equation as we start to see patients back in clinic. So I, I do think telemedicine will offer us an, ad, an advantage and an opportunity. And most of us have got pretty good at doing this over the last six weeks. Um, as Jack said, we, we are all acquiring website manner. Yeah, well, I, I, would, I would also say we're going to always wanna be more judicious. Uh, I, I wonder as I'm hearing Brendan talk about surgery practice and, uh, I think that there could be a real ongoing sustained benefit to having patients do some of their pre-op and post-op routine stuff uh, through telemedicine. I mean, whether you're you know, people driving 90 minutes through uh, LA freeways, at least before uh, we were uh, mandatory to shelter in place, uh, and Manhattan, I think there's just a lot of ways that people can practically have challenges of, of driving a, a considerable distance to pay a large amount of money in parking uh, that could potentially be done more efficiently. Obviously, the surgery is going to be in person, but, uh, but that and a lot of our 
routine visits, the, the imaging evaluations, all the people on routine follow-up, just checking their labs and going over their scans uh, lend themselves to, to telemedicine. But also, you know, we just got an approval for pembrolizumab every six weeks. And I think that's going to be a, a real benefit. We are There's going to be a growing incentive to have people uh, get treated with as few visits as possible. And, uh, and I, I think that's going to be a, a great sustained uh, efficiency. So I, I think that uh, now we're, we're going to have a, a soft return to anything like normalcy. And I don't know that we will get back to what things were ever like in 2019, just because we'll be forever changed by this. Yeah, it's Brendan. I was going to echo a little bit what Jack said. I, you know, th this idea maybe maybe we do sometimes treat a little too aggressively or look a little bit too hard sometimes. And I think one of the things we'll learn from this is, you know, maybe we don't have to be following patients every three months. Maybe you know, we can obviously spread treatment out instead of every three weeks to every six weeks. Um, and certainly in the post-surgical setting, we can um, often spread out our surveillances. I think that idea that, that maybe everything doesn't have to be done in a rush and the, the pressure that that puts on the patients, one good thing that may come out of this is that we'll be able to, to step back a little bit and, and understand some of the perspective. And, and that's probably some of the differences in European countries and other places too, um, that will hopefully be a learning point as we get through this. All right, well, thank you very much to the faculty for participating tonight and for sharing this insight with one another and with our listeners. And thank you so much, Dr. Stiles, for being available to discuss all of this with us. So we're now gonna open up the question and answer portion of this webinar. If you go to the ask question and answer box on the right corner of your screen, you can type your question directly in the space that it's in the box and then hit submit. So I'm gonna read through some of the questions that we have here that came in. Um, so one of our first questions is, um, did the research at ACR differentiate between small cell lung cancer and non-small cell lung cancer? Do you see different responses from either? So those data are, are captured in a lot of the registries, but uh, the numbers are, are still a little too small. You know, when we look at some of these big reports, uh, the Wuhan report uh, that had sort of much longer follow-up, gave a lot of very interesting information, uh, very robust it's still only 28 patients. And so once we start breaking down by different subsets, uh, the numbers get a little too small. So we didn't see those differences highlighted, um, but I think there are reasons to think those may be different um, and certainly different challenges in, in the hospital. Uh, so I think as those registries mature, we'll start to see more of that data come out. And also on the TerraVolt data, which was primarily all thoracic malignancies, out of these 200 patients, about 75% of those had non-small cell lung cancer. So I think to really differentiate between non-small cell and small cell um, outcomes is very difficult at this point in time. But I think, as Stephen said, uh, you know, as these registries grow, we'll be really able to differentiate um, outcomes. Although at the same time, our small cell patients tend to be you know, elderly have a higher incidence of other uh, comorbidities and are almost all on active therapy. And so you'd certainly be worried that those patients might have significantly higher risk on average than the non-small cell patients. But, you know, you're right. There's, there's so few numbers we don't really know for sure. All right, great. Uh, so what do we know about a known COVID positive patient who is asymptomatic, who is a potential candidate for surgery? Do you wait and for how long, or do you look into other treatment options? Yeah, I think it just depends on you know, most early stage cancers asymptomatic. So to me, it depends on the lesion. Is it a part solid? Is it you know, pure, pure ground glass and part solid can certainly wait some time, I believe. Um, I factor in the, the PET, um, the SUV uptake there. Does it have a high SUV for a small nodule? I worry a little bit more about those as being metabolically active. We know that those have higher rates of occult lymph node disease. And I, I do think the PET obviously comes into staging for other parts of the cancer as well. We've been trying to move ahead with biopsy of these when we can, just so we get it clearly established. And I think non-surgical biopsies, I think certainly surgeons shouldn't be taking every lung nodule to the OR in this time. Um, that just doesn't make sense as long as you have a good biopsy plan in place. But then sometimes um, different signs from the, the histology can guide us as to how aggressive it is as well. 
So I really think it has to be done on a case by case basis. There's lots of other good treatments and whether that's sending for stereotactic radiation or giving induction chemotherapy, I think depends a little bit on the size and location of the tumor. Although I have to say that we, we may not really want to give patients systemic therapy if they're COVID positive. You know, we saw sure. that active therapy, neutropenia, chemotherapy in the past three months were, were risks for pretty severe complications. So uh, for other treatments, those, those may be on hold as well. Yeah, it's a tough spot. Maybe waiting is the best in, in situations like that. We just, we just don't know the answer yet. All right. Um, here's another ACR question. So at ACR this week, we learned a bit about variation in COVID management strategies across the world. Uh, curious about your experience or take on the different treatments. Well, one of the things that, that jumped I'll out- I'll start. To me, I think it obviously just really- Go ahead, Steve. After you. Uh, one of the things that jumped out to me was was when uh, Dr. Barlesi from Gustave Roussy in Paris was outlining his outcomes and sort of the, the severity and their positive patients sort of made note that 23% of the patients that, had, that, were, that were positive were completely asymptomatic. Um, and it, it sort of shows that, you know, it, the more you test, the more you'll find and the more you'll be able to identify those patients and uh, potentially help treat them and, and care for them before they develop severe complications. Uh, I think these aggressive testing strategies are really going to help outcomes. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think testing is the key. And I think just understanding your own institution's resources is really the key. That idea about asymptomatic patients, we're seeing so much of it in New York. And you know, as we test more, we're really understanding. Um, the, the Cornell group had a, um, and it's amazing how sick these patients get quickly. We, we had a paper in the New England Journal this past week that showed, I think, of the patients who ended up needing a ventilator, 30% didn't even need supplemental oxygen when they came to the ER. Um, but they progressed so fast that they ended up requiring a ventilator at some point. So it, it without knowing um, positivity and without testing, I think it really is dangerous to, to aggressively treat cancer patients. So I, I very much favor a broad testing platform when available. Um, is there actual evidence or data that immunotherapy puts patients at risk with coronavirus? And if there is evidence, is it different for lung cancer? I think this was a common theme amongst all the presentations that we saw yesterday that immunotherapy did not seem to correlate with worse outcomes. I think, uh, you know, what was related to worse outcomes was exposure. Um, you know, I think coming into the cancer center or coming into the hospital, receipt of chemotherapy was, but I don't think we've seen at least a clear association with immunotherapy or TKIs at this point in time. But then again, you know, if I um, have a patient who has tested positive or is in contact with somebody who has tested positive in the past, I think I would be hesitant to treat similar to, so with similar concerns that Brendan has raised that these patients can, you know, go have, you know, significant symptoms very quickly. So we should be cautious. And we, we have had, you know, the, when you have enough small series uh, just uh, being uh, reported over the last several weeks to months, there may be, uh, you know, one uh, report here or there that suggested, but I would say that, you know, treating as we all are patients who have active cancer, uh, I would say there's certainly not evidence that should we should consider as a deterrent to treating with what is currently the best standard of care in settings like stage three after chemo radiation or stage four disease uh, for most of these patients. We'll, I'm sure, get more information, but I would say that the data are far too weak to dissuade us or our patients to pursue it when it's indicated. Yeah, it's I completely agree with that. I mean, I think the, the numbers so far haven't jumped out as being, you know, uh, particularly worse for immunotherapy, but more importantly, you know, uh, for patients who need it, the stage three patients who need consolidation to Valimab, maybe given Q4 instead of Q2, um, or patients who, you know, qualify for, for pembrolizumab now able, being able to give it Q6. Um, you know, I think if they, if they need it, I would not hesitate to give it despite the, the risk of infections. Uh, next question is, do you think concerns about access to biopsies will lead to more use and wider understanding of next generation sequencing? Uh, 
uh, I, I'm not sure I understand. I think that, uh, you know, I think that right now we're in a situation where a lot of repeat biopsies are far less likely to be done. I think one, one sequela could be that there's a real boost in liquid biopsy use. Uh, I know that, you know, as Charu asked Brendan already, I, I would say that invasive mediastinal staging is is being kind of suspended in many places for all sorts of reasons, including, you know, the, the need for uh, you know, PPE and, ex and, and kind of heightened exposure and just the lack of availability of pulmonologists. So that's an issue. I would, I would just say that, uh, that a uh, blood-based testing is, is likely to kind of be a, a diversion tactic that has one more reason to favor it. I think that tissue-based biopsies of a selected growing lesion uh, in acquired resistance is going to be a greater challenge. Uh, I, I think that in the initial diagnosis is still needing, it's gonna need to be tissue. Um, so I don't, I don't know that there'd be that much of a change, but I don't think that right now we're gonna see any enhancement of NGS testing overall, given the, postponements of diagnosis and the greater resistance and, you know, one more obstacle to getting tissue these days. Yeah, I think the, uh, the lack of availability of adequate tissue for testing is a larger problem just broadly in the lung cancer world than people realize. And, you know, liquid biopsy is, is helpful in patients like that, uh, even if you're needing to eventually get a tissue biopsy anyway. So maybe this, you know, one minor silver lining of this is making people more aware of that now as more situations arise when you're having trouble getting tissue. All right, um, another question here um, has to do with ventilators. So how do you feel about ventilators? There's been a lot of negative news lately that they do more harm than good. How is your hospital addressing that? <clears throat> Well, that's a good question. I think we've debated it a lot. We've had a pretty, um, you know, whether they do more harm than good, I think is tough. I think the patients who need ventilators are obviously the ones who are going down the, um, the bad pathway. I've seen some of the articles in the paper about, you know, keeping patients who are not on a ventilator and, and self-proning. And I think all that stuff is great. But once you hit a certain point, to me, the best safety mechanism is, is a ventilator and to, to do it well and to get taken care of by an ICU team. I think where some hospitals have gotten into trouble is where they either have limited resources and not enough ventilators or not enough skilled care providers, nurses, or doctors to look out for the patients who aren't on ventilators. And then you end up getting sort of respiratory arrests or issues on the floor and all of a sudden a situation that becomes uncontrollable. Um, we've had a pretty liberal use of ventilators and I feel confident that at the end of this, our numbers will, will stand out that that's been the right strategy to intubate patients who are in distress um, early and take as good a care of them as we can. It does become a challenge with some of the long-term issues with sedation and with sort of muscle weakness and dependency on the ventilator. But I think if we can get them through that acute phase, then, then we have a much better shot. All right, I think I'm gonna try and get one more question in here. So um, we have heard of lack of PPE on the front lines. Have you seen many healthcare workers getting infected? But I'm gonna kind of just broaden this a little bit and maybe just kind of talk more about, you know, what are some of the challenges that you've had to face um, because of maybe some of the lack of PPE? Well, we've, we've been fortunate. We really have not had that issue at, at my hospital. I think I've heard stories about it in New York, and, and I think it is a real concern. Certainly, every hospital out there has to protect the people who are there um, working on the front lines, and, and I really think that should be a priority of any place. Um, you know, different hospitals have different levels of resources, and, and some of our most at-risk patients are being served at hospitals where perhaps they don't have the best PPE. And so that's a problem that hopefully we'll learn from this um, situation that we have to do better with that in the future. Um, Fortunately, I have not had to, to deal with that issue. All right. Well, that appears to be all of the time that we do have for questions tonight. So again, a huge thank you to the faculty, Dr. West, Dr. Pinnell, Dr. Liu, Dr. Argawal, and Dr. Stiles for taking the time out of your very, very busy schedules to virtually sit down with OncLive 
and discuss some of these very important subject matters with our audience, um, not just this evening, but um, for the past uh, six consecutive Wednesdays, it's been an honor working with all of you on this webinar. So um, thank you so much for our listeners also. I really hope that you were able to gain some valuable insight into how clinical practice is changing in oncology during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and then again, just as a reminder, you will be able to listen back and watch this again shortly following this webinar. Um, and we will be bringing the series back at a date that's yet to be determined. So please continue to visit onclive.com, sign up for our e-newsletters, or follow us on social media on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook to get updates on when we will be broadcasting more of these webinars. For all of your oncology news, please visit onclive.com, where you can also find our COVID-19 Resource Center. So that concludes this evening's webcast. Thank you so much and have a wonderful night.